Left Mansfield to sign for Glasgow Rangers in 1981. That must have. How, how did that move all come about? Well, again, playing for Northern Ireland, you're playing the home international championships. Looking back, you find little snippets out. Apparently, John Gregg, who signed me, was a big friend of Billy Bremner, who I think they were roommates, so they were you know uh, really good pals. And Billy Bremner was a manager of Doncaster. So having seen me play for Northern Ireland, uh, I understand John Gregg phoned Billy Bremner and said, you know, playing at Mansfield, played against Doncaster, uh, what's that fella like? And from all accounts, Billy Bremner said, I'd take a chance on him. So I was playing at Hamden Park and centre midfield actually for Northern Ireland. And again, after the game, we are staying that, that night before going on to play Wales and we're leaving in the afternoon. I got a phone call that night, oh, we've agreed to sell you to Glasgow Rangers. Go and talk to them. <laughs> uh, we've given permission to leave the camp and you, somebody's picking you up in the morning. <laughs> and I said, what's the transfer fee? They said 100,000 pounds. <laughs> so they bought me for 10, selling me for 100. So I said, I want 10 grand. I thought you got 10%. No, no, I talked to them. <laughs> so I got picked up, had lunch with John Gregg, and that went strange because he's a legend up there in the statue and everything. Uh, and we're sitting down having a silver service lunch, you know, waitress comes in and I'm in the boardroom and um, I'm trying to, again, keep it all under control. I said, Mr. Greg, you know, if I sign for you, uh, I want £10,000, 10%. Everybody thinks you got 10%. He looked across the table and says, John, I'm very disappointed. The first thing you want to do is talk about money. And I'm just like dying at the other side of the table. I'm just shrinking. Oh, sh- this hasn't started well. So, so we've had lunch and had round eyebrows. Very impressive. I said, Mr. Greg, if I sign for you, I want ten thousand pounds. John, it should be passion, should be love for the game, and never mind all that nonsense about money. You know, we can get a free transfer from someone. We're taking a chance on you. Uh, I said, but I've been playing for Northern Ireland. Yeah, but it's just Northern Ireland, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. Uh, we'll give you £200 a week. I said, I'm getting £120 a week playing at Mansfield with 1,200 people watching us. Mm. Ah, well, you look smartly dressed, John. And <laughs> I spoke to Mansfield, we know you're on £120 a week and you're living quite well on it, obviously. So you'll definitely live on £200 a week in, in Glasgow. I said, well, I need time to think about this. You have 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed for £200 a week. <laughs> and you, you went up there and, and it was a period of the club that wasn't the most successful. Obviously, Aberdeen and Dundee United were uh, resurgent. Um, Celtic and Hearts were also competing as well. What, what was it like playing for Rangers at, at that time? Yeah, it was hard because looking again in hindsight, all the, the great treble teams were all getting old together. And you look at, say, saying about Alex Ferguson having to change Man United so many times, he changed them as he's ongoing. But it seemed to be, and maybe... Uh, Don Revy had been accused of that a little bit. You know, when he left, all the old players were winning things and then they all finished together, really, all 33, 34. So you look at Sandy Jardin, Willie Johnston, Tom McLean, Tommy Jackson, Tom Forsyth. You know, you can go through the team and they're all about 33, 34. So John Gregg's had to change it all at once. Mm. And then there were reassertions of Aberdeen and Dundee United and he was trying to play more of a passing game. But you need these old players, you need these senior players to bring the young players in slowly. You can't just put them all in together. Mm. So I, I struggled a bit. Um, because when you play fourth division football, it's everybody fighting and scrapping and, and maybe two people want the ball and everybody else is running away from it. And when you play top flight, there's eight or nine people want the ball and it's who you pass to. That's the difference. So I found it difficult uh, uh, in that respect. Um, and I played against Cologne early on I had a bad game and John Gregg said a froze which isn't a nice thing to, to read really that a froze and I again I thought I didn't freeze I said I had a bad game and I'm sure I'll have other bad games mm-hmm. but I wasn't used to everybody dropping back so in Europe they were all dropping back into their own half and letting you have the ball and I was playing right back at the time and it was finding it hard to find those gaps to pass the people so uh, in my first Celtic game people were talking about the game great game but it flashed by and the ball hit me in the shoulder uh, I was in front of Pat Bonner and then we had a corner kick and I think we were 1-0 down or 2-0 down 
and the ball had played out and somebody shot and I tried to get out of the way of Pat Bonner to put him off and it hit me in the shoulder and went over the post it went over the bar so we lost the game and uh, my friend was giving me a lift home and again the uh, commentator was on that they're doing question and answer session and questions and this guy James Sanderson was the, com- the, the guy in the questions and this question came we had the game yes Jim it was the game I haven't missed Rangers for 35 years I must tell you, I have seen the worst player Rangers have ever signed in 35 years. I can't believe they've dropped into the fourth division to pick up a donkey like McClellan. <laughs> so my, my friend was trying to turn the radio off. <laughs> I said, no, leave it. Uh, and a strange thing happened. About uh, three weeks later, I trained on a Friday and I completely dislocated my ankle and it was the wrong way around. Wow. I thought I'd broken it and the players thought, Everybody thought my career was over because I couldn't see. My foot was actually behind me. Oof. At the end of my shin, there was my heel. And um, and uh, I went into hospital, had an operation. Everybody thought my career was over. And I was out for seven months. Mm. But looking back, I could then adapt to living in Glasgow. And I'd done a pre-season to get fit. And I wasn't, not, I wasn't up to it, but I was finding a bit of pressure. And then I was injured, and for seven months, I was six months, I was training in the gym by myself. Mm. So I was fit as anything. And I got into the Rangers team on the 17th of March for the last dozen games of the season, playing the cup final against Aberdeen. Uh, they beat us. Um, and then I went to another, I went to the World Cup. I just got into the Northern Ireland squad for the World Cup, and everybody thought it wouldn't, my career was over, but I got in for the, the, the final 22 or something. And we'd done this pre season at Brighton. But I'd done three pre seasons. I'd done pre season to get fit, got injured, done six months of pre season by myself, and then, well, and then uh, to get in the Rangers team, done another pre season to get the World Cup in Spain, and I was like flying because I was as fit as doing one arm press ups and all sorts. So uh, by accident, it ended up the best thing that could happen to me because I stepped out of the pressure. I got really, really fit, by, not by accident, with, with the injury I had. Um, so when I realised keeping fit is the thing that keeps you on top. You mentioned they are dealing with living in Glasgow. It must have been a big jump for you, a big shock to the system, moving from Mansfield to living in the, the goldfish bowl of Glasgow. Because a lot of players, a lot of talented players struggle with it, don't they? Yeah, it's the same as Leeds United. Leeds United sign a lot of players and they can't handle the pressure because it's signing for Leeds, signing for Glasgow, signing for Rangers or Celtic, signing for Man United is pressure. And it's an added pressure. So you can be a big fish in a small team and you think you're great and you go to a big town or a big city and now you're a, a small fish in a big pool and it's whether you can develop and be the big fish in the big pool and that's what stands uh, the top players out from from Joe Average if you like so um, yeah I used to walk around Glasgow and not take too much notice uh, it's a bit like the high schools did that people would give me stick but there's three or four Celtic fans would give me stick I'd just talk nice to them and after 10 minutes, the, the, the one that's giving me stick, the other three are giving him stick for giving me stick because I wasn't trying to inflame it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I just sort of said, well, I'm a footballer. How did, how did Charlie Nicholas do today and all that nonsense? And how did Pat Bonner do? And, you know, Davy Province, we'd asked them about how their team did and they were all right. So I just found it, uh, um, it was all right. I would put up with all the nonsense on the pitch, but I wouldn't put up with it as such off the pitch. I'd try and calm it down a bit. Yeah. One of the highlights, I guess, of your time at Ibrox is winning uh, that League Cup when McCoy scored the hat-trick in, against Celtic. Were you captain in the side as well? That must have been a, a highlight for you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you don't realise you're captain material, but I was captain at Bangor. I sort of became captain at Manfred for a while when somebody got injured. And then I became captain of Glasgow Rangers and I became captain of Watford and I became captain of Leeds when Strachan was injured. So you don't realise the qualities you've got. You just play football. And Ali Dawson had had recovered from a bad injury. And uh, when he came back in the World Cup, John Gregg says, you're a different player from the one that left. And what it was, I realised I'd played against the best in the world. All this hype was about the best players in the world. And I managed it and I thought, well, it's only, it only hype. It's not, you know, do your job and you'll be all right. So he pretended he was going to experiment with the captaincy and give it to me and it stayed with me. Um, so yeah, it's uh, the pressure's there as well, but as you say, it was a different team to the Legends team, so there wasn't too many probably captains about, I would have said, I think would sound. Well, Gregor Stevens was there, and Cullen Adams, 
there's another Adam, his brother played for Celtic. There's Bobby Russell, there's Robert Pritt, Sandy Jard, not Sandy Jardin had left the John Hearts. Um, Sandy Clark came, young Ali McCoy came a bit later. So there wasn't really a senior player there, which made it difficult for setting the standard. One of the players there was Davy Cooper. Uh, you were his one of his teammates. What, what was he like? Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely the Moody Blue. Uh, <laughs> definitely the Moody Blue. But me and Davy got on really well together, um, probably because we respected each other. But uh, in training, and um, what I couldn't understand in Glasgow, and the public was on every club, they just slaughter each other when you're training, saying you're a crap, you're this and you're that, and John McDonald, and you're crap, you're useless. And, I thought, how do you encourage people if, if that's, you know, the idea is to encourage people and make them better, but they used to just slaughter. And maybe that's how the, the, the senior players at that time egged each other on or, or got the best out of each other. But for all these young players that have come at a different time in Redfern, um, you're thinking, God, it was, it was a horrendous. And I thought, well, how, how can you build a team, you know, when they're all behaving like this to each other? Um, but David Cooper, yeah, me and David got on uh, really well together. Um, and I remember David McKinnon signed from Party Thistle. And on the game, he passed the ball to him about 10 yards past David Cooper on the match. And David Cooper just stood there and says, I'm standing here, pass the ball to my feet. He says, you can run for it, David. And I can't tell you what David Cooper said on the pitch. He slaughtered him. He said, if you can't pass the ball to my feet, <laughs> swing one <laughs> and get off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, he just stood there with his hands on his hips and said, I'm here. You pass it to my feet. <laughs> Unbelievable. You, you obviously won the League Cup as well the, the year after, um, but but you left left the club. Uh, were you disappointed to... to when you finally left it to join Watford? Yeah, I was. I mean, I, I realised I became captain within a year, so I should have had a pay rise. Didn't ask for a pay rise. I thought, they'll come to me. Mm. And they never did. So three years later, I'm on £220 a week. And uh, they brought me in and offered me a five-year contract on another £50 a week. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not acceptable. Because John Gregg said, you've got to earn your signing on fee. You know, you can once get one, you earn it, you'll get it if you earn it. And he left and Jock Wallace became the manager. Uh, he had an agent and uh, Bill McMurdo. And um, he didn't want me, he said, you can't have an agent. I said, well, have you got an agent? <laughs> so it all kicked off like that. And I just kept quiet about it, never spoke about it. It was private and I found out they were leaking stories to the press. And uh, then they took the captaincy off me and dropped me, which I thought was out of order. I said, if you drop me, you drop me when I'm first in the argument. You don't drop me eight weeks before a cup final. Mm-hmm. So he dropped me. I said I'd never play football again and then uh, called me back four weeks later because it was so bad and it disappointed me that Craig Patterson accepted the captaincy because I thought if nobody accepts it then he's got a problem but he went for the glory so I wouldn't lift the cup which I regret now Mm. we won the cup and I wouldn't lift it it was only instinctive it wasn't planned Um, so I'm about sixth or seventh up and Bobby Russell passed it to me and I just everybody was holding it up and and uh, waving to the crowd and I, he just handed it to me and I turned around and just handed it on so it became a big issue at the time um, and to be fair to the football league they didn't deserve that but it wasn't anything that was planned it was just that um, instinctive thing and you were out for a long spell but then you were brought back in your final game was Inter Milan am I correct? yeah that's right well that's what I mean he dropped me and said he'll never play football again he'll play in the reserves and he, won't, he, won't, he priced me out of the market and uh, um, so that's why I was out so I'd been dropped and then they were so bad that they played me again. And uh, eventually I said to them, well, emotionally you're going through a lot of turmoil because if you do your job, you expect to be rewarded. You do your job. If you don't do your job, you don't expect to be rewarded. So I'd become captain, regular international player, led in the cup finals, and then told them worth nothing. So um, that, was the, that was the difficult thing. So I just said, listen, I'm going through turmoil. I'll never play for you again after Milan. I'll pack up. I'll just give up football and go and get, I'll go back to Northern Ireland and help my mum look after the shop and uh, I wasn't bluffing now looking back to do that at 28 at the height of my career because I thought I'm just being left to be lifted and dropped and lifted and dropped at the manager's discretion which isn't right because I wasn't doing anything wrong and the players um, didn't really back me which was disappointing um, but the fans took my side as soon as he dropped me the fans started cheering me and booing the manager which doesn't help no. <laughs> you only go in one place 
So after the game, he said, I've just sold you to Watford, go and talk to them. I said, well, Tottenham want me. He says, you're not going there. So they could even force you to go to a smaller club. Mm-hmm. But now you find the agent saying, he's going here. <laughs> That's where he's going. He's going nowhere. So now it's the, the reverse, only in the top players, of course, or the top. Mm-hmm. So it, yeah, so it was disappointing, but I can't complain because I ended up uh, you know, going to Watford. They treated me very well. And they end up coming to the Leeds and winning the championship medal. So, you know. Yeah, I was going to say that your five years at Watford, what was it like? Because Graham Taylor was the manager there, wasn't he? Yeah, he was very good. And he treated me like a person yeah, yeah. And, and like a man. He was, uh, Jock Wallace was treating you like a baby, you know, he was behaving like the baby. Um, and Graham Taylor was very honest with me. And after international, he says, Oh, you can come back Friday. So the international might have been the Tuesday, the Wednesday, he said, You can come back Friday. And I questioned him, I said, why can't I come back Friday? And the others come back the next day. He says, because you'll be ready, but Saturday, whatever happens, they won't. So you, you stay off. So, you know, it'd, it'd be that, um, um, not that lenient. He wasn't lenient, but he just knew what was what. One incident um, that not counted that, uh, we're playing Nottingham Forest, and I said, I want to stay up and see people at Mansfield. So after the game, he says, no, you've got to come back. We don't finish till you're back at Vicarage Road. I said, well, that's another three hours, two and a half hours back from not. He says, well, that's the way it is. And he was okay. I said, well, why? He said, well, I fight for the players to have a good bus. We put food on, we put a chef on, we put everything on. And he said, if we have 15 players going up to, say, Newcastle and five players come back, well, the directors will take that off me next year. Mm-hmm. So he said, you, you don't finish until... And he said, sometimes I don't want to talk to you after the game because I'm angry and I like to get my thoughts in place. And I'll t- he used to talk to the players when the bus parked up at Vicarage Road and then he'd have his talk. Uh, so I had to then go back to Vicarage Road <laughs> and then drive uh, three hours back up the Mansfield. <laughs> well, but it made sense, you know what I mean? Yeah. To talk to you, it makes sense, it makes sense. So he was a very good manager uh, with a, a small budget, but he had a really, really good team. Yeah, he did well at Watford, didn't he? And then, I mean, five years there, you were voted Player of the Year twice. So was that yeah, probably... me and Tony Coulton, yeah. Well, it's strange, he joined in November, mid-November, and I got Player of the Season at the end of the... <laughs> At the end of that season, <laughs> and now I can't say the players were bad. The other players were bad, but they were bottom of the league when I joined them. They'd won one in sixteen, and we had a very good goalkeeper who won most of the other player of the years, uh, Tony Coulton. Mm-hmm. And um, first year in the top flight, they finished second. But the, the clubs always catch like Leicester. They catch you out the second time. They know what to do against you. And I think they'd won one in sixteen. They spent three hundred thousand pound replacing Steve Sherwood with Tony Coulton. I think his first four games he let 16 goals in, or five games he let 16 goals in, and then they signed me, and they'd won one and six, one and 16, and they won the next five in a row, so they went straight up the table and sort of finished 10th or 11th, so um, Steve Sherwood said, what's that about you before they bought Tony Coulton, <laughs> and Tony Coulton said, I now know what Steve Sherwood feels like, because they're the young defence, you know, yeah. And uh, Graham Taylor asked me to be captain. I said, I'm sure you've got a good captain and you might be doing that as a carrot to try and get me to sign. I said, I'm quite happy to sign. You'll have a good captain. I'll just, I'll, just, I'll, I'll learn the captaincy. Um, so, um, Wilf Rostrum was a captain, good fullback, was a winger for Arsenal, uh, went to fullback. Um, John Barnes was there, Luther Blissett was there, Kenny Jacket was there, Nigel Gibbs, who came to Leeds for a while as a coach. So they had a decent team, yeah. um, but just lacking confidence. 